Hello, welcome to the Church Online. Hey Living Hope, I'm Pastor Steve and I just want to let you know a couple things that uh, are a bit different about today. So the first thing is, um, obviously it's Mother's Day, so uh, Happy Mother's Day. Secondly, there's actually going to be no kids portion today due to Mary being sick. Um, also worship's going to be looking a little bit different because um, technology is fun and also uh, the sermon's going to be different today than what we originally planned. So we're not continuing in our series on the Ten Commandments. We're actually going to be uh, doing a special Mother's Day message from Joanne Goodwin, who she's a hilarious woman. She's amazing. And so um, as today's going to look a little bit different, even in light of the fact that uh, things have looked different already for the last several weeks than what everyone's been used to from before that, um, I know you'll be able to roll with the punches. And so I ask that you would uh, press into worship. I've asked that you would really open your hearts and your minds to uh, what God would have you learn today and, and grow from. So uh, I'm going to pray. And But first off, again, I want to say Happy Mother's Day. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you for joining us. Jesus, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the fact that uh, even though we are apart, that God, we get to be together. So Lord, I pray that the church would be unified in spirit and that God, we'd be able to worship in spirit and in truth. And that God, more lives be changed and transformed for your glory as a result of us trying to be as faithful to you as possible. And everybody said, amen. It's not. 
Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, He is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, He is my song. For You are good. You're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good.
I am proud of my wife for sticking to her weight loss program and making progress even during this difficult time. And I value her for her creativity and her ability to think outside the box and do unorthodox things like teach our children how to dance in the rain. I'm proud of her for crafting with us. I value her for caring and loving for us. I'm proud of my mom for stepping up to into her new role as our teacher. I value my mom for snuggling me every night. I am proud of her for, for taking me somewhere. I value you her for taking for doing crafts with me. I like when mom does painting with me. Mom, you're a wonderful mentor and a great prayer warrior, and you've been the best thing in my whole life. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day! Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day! Happy Mother's 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 Day. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Thanks for letting me into your living room. I love the decor. I love the pajamas you're wearing. You got your coffee. Some of you have snacks. I got my coffee. Wouldn't this be beautiful every Sunday morning if you could come in in your pajamas with a cup of coffee? Yeah, yeah. It's Mother's Day, though. And you know, what does that mean when I say that? When you hear Happy Mother's Day, like some of you, you got great kids, you got a wonderful mother, and you think, yay, I'm going to celebrate all this wonderful motherhood. And some of you are thinking it brings sadness. Because maybe your kids are lost and in dark places, and you're worried and you're concerned, and so it kind of brings a pain to you. And some of you, God forbid, have lost a child. Can't even imagine that kind of agony. And some of you, don't have your own children, and some of you have planned it that way, and you're delighted, and you're happy. Some of you don't have biological children, and it hurts you, and it brings a pain to you because you really wanted to have your own children. Just we all have different ideas. Some of you, maybe you never really had a mother who cared for you. Some mothers have abandoned their children at birth. Some kept them and just abused them and I mean, mother holds a different picture for so many of us. But I, I hope that as we talk about this Mother's Day, I'm not going to do the whole Proverbs 31 thing. We all know we can't do that. <laughs> I, I know, I know. I, it's, it's there. It's, it's good. But you know what I want to talk about? I want to talk about how God mothers us and comforts us. And you say, well, hey, you, know, you, can't, you can't just say that. Well, you know, I can in, in Isaiah 66, verse 13, it says, As a mother comforts a child, so will I comfort you. God said that himself to his people. As a mother comforts a child, so will I comfort you. And I want to talk about some of the comfort the Lord gives to us. His mothering, his nurturing. And, you know, often we relate that more to a woman. I, I know it's not always fair because some men are much more nurturing than their wives. Um, my husband is a nurturer, and he's really good at it, and he's fabulous at it. But it doesn't mean that, that also it doesn't mean that if you're a nurturer, it doesn't mean as a woman that you can't also be a strong warrior for God. And a, but it's just that some of these associations are usually made towards women. We tend to be seen as the more nurturing. 
And, you know, they've done some great leadership studies. And when they discovered the leadership styles of men and women, they have often found that women tend to be more nurturing towards their staff, more inclusive. So, I don't know. So, we're just going to call it the mothering part of God. Um, you know, in that verse I just read to you that um, he said, as, as, I, as a mother comforts a child, so will I comfort you. Do you know, that comes from Isaiah 66. And in Isaiah chapters 56 to 66, are, it contains an oracle that was written to God's people after exile and after the second temple was built. And, you know, some of the people, when they saw the new temple, wept because they remembered the old one. They remembered the one in all its glory that, that Solomon had built and and they longed for the old. And some people left family behind in Babylon. And some of them died in Babylon. And some of them are still there. And they're back in their homeland, but they're under foreign rule now. And it's just not the same as it was. And so in that oracle to them, he says, as, as, a, um, as a mother comforts a child, so will I comfort you. And, you know, I was thinking of this pandemic when it's over, people say, oh, it'll never be the same. Everything's going to be different. And I don't know. I don't know what it'll look like. Some people will have lost their businesses. Some people will have lost a loved one who had to die alone. Finances, situations, school, I don't know what it's going to look like. But perhaps this same thing can apply to us. Perhaps God is saying to you, be comforted. I can comfort you just like your mother comforts you. I've got that here for you. You know, one of the ways that um, when I think of a, a mother's comfort, I show it by cooking. I cook. I love to cook for my children. I love to bake for my children. That's how I show them love, one of the ways. It's just, you know, even during this pandemic, Easter Easter Sunday, you know, we took a big basket of homemade pancakes and sauce and whipped cream and strawberries and my homemade cupcakes, oh, they were beautiful. Green and yellow and pink, beautiful. Little Easter eggs on top. That's how I was showing them my love. Look what I've done for you to show you my love. Well, you know, I, I like to say we have a God who sometimes cooks for us. Yeah, well, uh, there's a couple examples in the Bible. One of them was in the Old Testament in 1 Kings 19. When Elijah, who had just had a, a huge victory, he, um, he you know, the, with the prophets of Baal, and they wanted to pray down fire, and they begged their gods, and they did everything they could, and they danced, and they called, and no fire. Then Elijah said, not only will I call down fire, but soak this baby with water. They poured water all over the thing, and he prayed, and of course, God came, consumed the, the sacrifice, consumed the altar, licked up the water, it says, Great, a great victory, and then the prophets of Baal were destroyed. And then he heard that Jezebel, the wicked queen, was going to kill him. I guess he got scared, maybe he got depressed, maybe you get the blues after a big victory, sometimes that happens, but he ran away, and at one point, he left his servant aside and said, let me let, just go into the desert, I'm just going to go into the desert by myself. And he did, and he, he found a broom tree, I don't know what a broom tree is, I could have researched it, but I didn't bother. I heard the word broom, thought of housekeeping. I don't like broom trees. Actually, apparently, it's a kind of a sheltering, low-level tree. He went under that tree, and he said, God, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Kill me. Pretty low state to be in. But what I like is, God didn't immediately go to him and say, okay, Look what I just did. And now you're sitting here saying you want to die. Come on, what's your problem? Get up. Are you not trust me anymore? No, you know what he did? It said the angel of the Lord woke him up and said, I baked just some bread over coals. And I got a jug of cold water here for you. You see, the angel of the Lord is a phrase that's used many times in the Old Testament to mean uh, a manifestation of God himself or Jesus. Uh, we call it a, a theophany. Uh, somehow God manifests himself in his presence. You know several examples of that. Uh, the fourth man in the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the voice out of the burning bush, Moses heard. Manifestations of God. So when we hear the angel of the Lord, we know this is a, a manifestation of God himself. And instead of getting mad at him, he cooked bread for him. 
Do you love this? I'm a mother. I love this. Woke him up, said, eat. So he, he ate and he drank some of the water. Then he went back to sleep. Then the angel of the Lord returned and woke him up again and said, okay, eat. I got some more here for you. Eat. Rest. And then he said, I want you to go up to that, the Mount, uh, what was that Mount? Horeb. <laughs> I want you to go up there and uh, I'm going to speak to you up there. And you know, that's the same mountain where Moses heard the uh, burning bush speak to him. Anyways, he went up there. He journeyed over to it, having been strengthened by the food and the rest. And he went up into this cave. And then God said to him, okay, what are you doing here? I don't know if he said it like that. I'm saying it like a Jewish mother. What are you doing here? But he said, what are you doing here? And out came his complaint. And he said, you know, I have been zealous for you, God. But they wouldn't accept your covenant. And they broke down your altars. And, and they're killing all the prophets. And I'm the only one left. And then the voice said to him, go out on the side of the mountain. I'm, I'm going to pass by. My presence is going to pass by. So he stood out there. And this magnificent wind that just rocked everything. And then the earthquake that shook and the rocks shook. And then a fire. But each time it said God was not in the wind. God was not in the fire. God was not in the earthquake. And then came a gentle, still voice. And that was God. And then he said to him for the second time, Okay, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he poured out his complaint again. I'm the only one left. They wouldn't accept you. They tore down the hospital and they're trying to kill me. And, you know. and then God said to him, he said, okay. And he talked to him and we're assuming the gentle voice was still going on. He's not slapping him upside the head. He's saying, okay, listen, Elijah, this is what I want you to do. He gave him instructions. I want you to go down there. I want you to anoint Elisha. I want you to do this. And, da, da, da. and uh, by the way, there are 7,000 still who have not bowed to Baal. Uh, you all know that story, but, but to me, the gentleness with which God treated him, fed him, let him sleep, gave him some more bread, then gave him an audiovisual presentation showing that he wasn't always in these great things, but sometimes he was a gentle voice. He cooked for him. I love that. In the New Testament, we have an example of him cooking for us too. Uh, this is a beautiful verse. John 21, 12. Come and have breakfast. You know who said that? Jesus. The disciples are in the boat. Jesus is on the shore. Now, this is after his resurrection. He has seen the disciples. We think this is the third time. The first time he appeared with the disciples and, and Thomas wasn't there. The next time... Uh, uh, Thomas was there and he saw all of them. And then this time he was on the shore and he saw them fishing, not very successfully. He said, boys, throw the net on the other side. And they did and they hauled so many fish they couldn't even get the nets into the boat. And then John recognized, it's the Lord. And so they went whipping off to the shore. Of course, Peter first because Peter is, in my estimation, a little bipolar. He's either denying Jesus or he's the first one to step out of the boat anyway. So Jesus... So Peter runs to the shore because Jesus is saying, come and have breakfast. <laughs> he cooked fish for them. And he made bread for them. We don't have any indication that Jesus had ever approached Peter before this about what he had done about his denying him three times. We don't have any indication that did. So this was probably the first time. So they ate. Everybody was comfortable. They had lots of fish. Everything was good. Then Jesus takes Peter aside and says, Peter, do you love me? Oh, yes, Lord, you know I do. Okay, but Peter, do, do you love me? Oh, Lord, you know I do. Why are you asking this? And then again, Peter, do you love me? I don't know. Sometimes people say three times because he denied him three times. I don't know. But when God asked him, when Jesus asked him those questions, he then said, now I have work for you to do. He didn't throw him out because he'd been an idiot. He didn't push, put him aside because he hadn't been perfect. He just reaffirmed his love. You're mine, aren't you, Peter? You're mine. Okay, feed my sheep. 
and follow me. Two beautiful examples of God cooking for us. As a mother cooks for a child. As a mother comforts a child. I just love those. Maybe it's because I have this thing about food. I love food. I love it too much, but... So then, that's literally cooking for them. And then we have that verse in the psalm, Psalm 23, 5, where it says, He prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Wow. In the presence of your enemies? Some say the shepherd and sheep analogy is carried on down to verse 5. Some say, no, it's a whole new one. He's now presenting himself as a host. He's prepared a banquet for them. But the key part is it's in the presence of their enemies. And so that can say to us today, what is the enemy surrounding you right now? Is it the outcome of this pandemic? Have you, have you lost your business? Have you lost a lot of money? Have you lost a loved one? God forbid. What are you going through? Is it finances? Is it trouble in the family? What is it? What are you going through? And, and I believe God says to us, in the middle of all that, I am spreading a table for you. I will feed you. I will comfort you in the middle of all this. He comforts us today. He makes a table for us today. So he doesn't literally feed us now, but how does he feed us and comfort us now? Well, I think there are several ways. One is when we come to the table of the Lord, communion. We come to participate in the body and the blood to remember. And when you're feeling down and overwhelmed by the enemy around you, to pause and take time to remember, this is the price you paid for me. I really am forgiven. You really do love me. And the community of it, you're doing it with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. That fellowship, that communion, that's one of the ways he comforts us. Another way he comforts us now is, um, I just lost my place there. Oh, yeah, is sometimes with, just with his scripture. Sometimes you can read the scriptures and, you know, you do it a lot and you read it. But every once in a while, God uses one scripture specifically to speak comfort into your heart. I remember once I was going through something and uh, terribly concerned for someone in my family, terrified for someone in my family. Panic was starting to grip my heart because there was nothing I could do. And I was saying, God, God, what are you doing? And you know what immediately popped into my head? Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. I didn't even know where it was in the Bible. I found out later it's in Psalm 62. I don't remember ever having learned it, but it jumped into my spirit and immediately I felt the comforting presence of the Holy Spirit. Find rest, O oh my soul. Where? In this? Or maybe you can do that? No, in God alone. In God alone. And I was comforted. Sometimes we have to teach our children how to soothe themselves, how to self-soothe. Sometimes with a blankie or somebody, when you're not right there, they can soothe themselves. I have a little grandson. God love him. Beautiful. Two years old. Gorgeous. And we saw him doing this a couple times, and we were quite surprised. He was upset. He wasn't getting his way, and he didn't like that. I can't, he says. He's, he was mad. But then he sort of stood at the wall and went. And then he had another little cry, and then. And then he turned around, and he was okay. And we were saying, is he, is he learning to self-soothe? Has he just learned how to soothe himself? Sometimes we need to do that when we can't sense the comfort of God. I was driving down the highway one day, overwhelmed with grief again for someone that I loved very much. And I didn't know what to do. And I, didn't, and I remember saying to God, God, please, please, if I ever needed to feel, to sense your presence and your comfort, it's now and nothing, nothing. So I self-soothed. 
I said, God, I really, I really wanted to feel your presence. But since I cannot feel it, I will rest on what I know to be true. And I know you hold me and my children in the palm of your hand. A couple months later, it was Mother's Day. And you know what someone gave me for Mother's Day? A ceramic figurine of a hand with a child nestled in it. Had God heard me on the highway? Yeah. Did I automatically feel his comfort? No. I self-soothed. I encouraged myself with the things that I knew to be true from his word. Sometimes he comforts us through the people of God. Community, that's why we need each other. I remember one time at our church camp. Again, I guess I get overwhelmed a lot in my life. Overwhelmed with personal pain that I didn't know how to deal with. And I went up to the altar and I just cried. And this retired minister came up to me. He saw my pain. He felt my pain. He just put his arms around me and cried with me. Oh, and then he prayed too, but he cried with me. If that man could feel that for me. Is that how my Jesus sees me? He weeps with us. He feels our pain. The people of God. I'm suggesting to you today that God can even speak to you sometimes through music. He brings back a spiritual song or a hymn or a, a something and you're touched. Very concerned about someone in my family another time. And I heard the song, there is always a place at the table. There's a feast that is waiting all your own. Your place, listen to this one. Your place is set each time the family gathers. But it will never be the same till you are home. Some of you need to come to the table. It's set there for you. Some have been away from the table and you think, no, I gotta come back. I need the comfort and love of a nurturing parent right now. I need to be fed, come to the table. Some of you are already at the table, but maybe you've pushed back a little time to pull up close. Time to pull your chair up close to the table and taste of the food and let him speak to you. And if you have never known the comfort and love of a caring mother, you can get it directly from him. Not only is he a father to the fatherless, he is a mother to the motherless. Pull into the table. Come home. Come home. Father, I'm asking you to just put that, that thing in people's heart like you do that says, come home. I ask you, Father, to, to encourage us to pull up closer to the table, to sense you, to eat from your banqueting table. Do this, Lord, this morning as we sit in your presence, as we sit in our living rooms, as we are together with our family. Speak to us in our hearts, we pray. Amen. God bless you.